When I began seminary, um, back when Amy Grant was a contemporary singer, uh, not long after she wrote by word, um, I had more questions than I did answers. Um, but there was one question I thought I had answered before I went to seminary, and that is, what is the Bible? And for me, my answer at that time is the Bible was an outdated and confusing, internally contradictory collection of stories whose best use seemed to be as a way to get to psychology or science where contemporary truth resided. So you may wonder, how did I get to that answer? And, and the answer for me is by reading the Bible. I read the first two chapters of Genesis, and there I found two contradictory stories of creation. In the first one, the seven-day creation story, all of creation occurs except for humans, and male and female are created simultaneously on the sixth day of creation near the end. And then, in the second story, I open it, and, and then the male is created first, and then everything else, and then the female. I thought, well, these, these don't match up. Turn to the New Testament, two stories of Jesus' birth. In Luke's Gospel, the Holy Family begins in Nazareth. They go to Bethlehem, where Jesus is born. They return to Nazareth. Matthew's Gospel, they start in Bethlehem. They go to Egypt to escape Herod's murderous wrath. And when he dies, they go to Nazareth for the first time. Again, they don't match. I read the stories of Jesus cleansing the temple and, and overturning the money changers' tables. Matthew, Mark, and Luke places this important event within the last week of Jesus' life before his crucifixion. John places it at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, three years before his crucifixion. And I thought, how can, how can that be? Both of those placements cannot be correct. Inconsistent and confusing, and so I began to think, also unreliable. And so that's how I went to seminary. That's how I began seminary. Here's how I finished seminary. My last semester there, I, I uh, played a very small role in, in helping to teach incoming freshman Bible classes. And, and uh, at graduation, I was fortunate enough to receive the Raymond Kimbrell Award for Excellence in Biblical Studies. So how did I get from there to there? And the answer is, again, I read the Bible. This time, though, I read the Bible on its own terms. Rather than imposing my terms back on the Bible, I began to read it on its own terms, and in doing so, found a depth and a richness that I could find nowhere else, nowhere else. Those two creation stories that I thought were so contradictory turned out to be complementary, and reading them together helped me understand more about creation and about the creation's creator God. And so when I read in the New Testament the differences in the birth stories and the placement of the cleansing of the temple, Help me to understand better the theology of the authors who are using words to paint a word portrait, a picture of Jesus. And so understanding that helped me to understand the rest of the portrait as well. I began to discover what my New Testament professor often said, Jack Levison, the delight is in the difference. The delight is in the difference. Or perhaps one way to approach the Bible on its own terms is to begin with what the Bible is not. It's not a, a magic book. It didn't come to us magically. It doesn't contain magic formulas for life. It is, it's not a self-help book. It's more about God than it is about us. It's more about helping us to become a part of God's story than it is helping God to become a part of the stories that we want to write for ourselves. And it's certainly not a book of role models. In the scriptures we come across, murderers and, and adulterers and cowards, and those are the people that God uses <laughs> to get God's work done. The, the Bible does not describe a golden age and our purpose as recreating that golden age. Nothing like that at all. And the Bible isn't even a book, or at least one book. As we said with the children earlier, the Bible's a library. It's a library of 66 different writings that came into place over 1,500 years in time. And, and just as we don't read mysteries in the same way and for the same purpose that, that we read a history book or, or science, we read the literature in the scripture in its own way as well. We read the history there as history, and we read the fiction that is there as fiction, and we read the metaphor that is there as metaphor. What makes the Bible or the library one 
is that it's the story of God, our creator and our redeemer and our sustainer who is understood most clearly through the living word, Jesus Christ. The Bible, that library, 1,300 pages, roughly, almost 1,000 of those in what we call the Old Testament and almost 300 in what we refer to as the New Testament. The word testament means covenant. It describes the relationship that God establishes with each one of us, first through Israel, the first covenant, or the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and then through Jesus Christ, the New Covenant, or the New Testament. All of the Old Testament, except for a couple of verses in Esther and a small passage in Daniel, written in Hebrew. And so many people talk about it as the Hebrew Bible, or the Hebrew Scriptures, and Next week, we'll do an overview of the Old Testament in 25 minutes or less, and we'll try to get a sense of what happens there. Well, beginning a couple of hundred years before Jesus and before his birth and continuing to a couple hundred years after his resurrection, another large group of religious writings were produced in Israel. Some of those are called the Apocrypha, for the hidden books. They're, they're written in Greek about Hebrew times about the Old Testament. And so they're not a part of the Jewish Bible, Jewish scriptures. Some Christians include them as a part of the Old Testament. Some include them as a separate section between the Old and the New. Some don't include them at all. For United Methodists, we don't consider the Apocrypha to be scripture. We consider it to be an important resource, though, for understanding the world which helped produce Jesus because it was written at the time the world helped produce Jesus. Then there's the New Testament. And those writings within two generations of Jesus' resurrection in a couple of weeks, the New Testament, 25 minutes or less. And then there's also some other writings about what we call New Testament times that weren't included in the scriptures either, extra-biblical writings. And these are writings that were not included because in Tom Wright's words, they reflect an individual, personal, privatized, what can God do for me approach to life that is different from the biblical approach to life. Well, the question becomes, who did the including and the excluding? And if I tell you a church committee, you might become a little skeptical, because we've all been on church committees <laughs> from time to time. This is a different kind of church committee, not one local church, but the universal church, a special committee called a synod. And they weren't really making the decisions about what was in and out as much as ratifying the decisions that had been made by hundreds of of individual churches over hundreds of years. For three centuries, Christians had gathered and had read these sacred writings and had determined in which writings they encountered God and were encountered by God, by the living Christ, and in which ones they were not. And so the synod ratified the decision that the local church made. So how can we think of and how can we read the scriptures on their terms and not impose our own Terms. And in a moment, I want to look carefully at a couple of images that the Bible gives us that, at least for me, helps me understand how to do that. And, and then to lift up three simple questions that we can ask ourselves whenever we come across any passage, old or new. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the many ways in which you reveal yourself to us, including these ancient scriptures that we have gathered together in this sacred book, the Bible. Thank you for that, and help us this day through your spirit to uncover more and more about how we can read these scriptures faithfully so that we can be faithful followers of your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. In the passage Lisa read a couple of moments ago, Paul says that all scripture is inspired by God. That's an image word, inspired. It's connected to respiration. It's connected to breathing. And so it says that all scripture is God-breathed in the sense that God's spirit moved through the authors. God's spirit inspired the authors. And, and just as the same breath, a human breath, let's say, uh, is blown through a trumpet and through a flute and pronounces and makes radically different sounds, so the same spirit of God through a different author in a different time and a different place can produce radically different writings. As you read through the scriptures, you discover very different approaches to life. Phillips Brooks once described preaching as truth through personality. And it seems that fits the understanding of, of scripture inspired as well, that the truth of God comes through the personalities of each of those 
writers, without erasing them, without overcoming them, using those personalities to get God's truth across. Paul writes of God's inspiration of the scriptures and not God's dictation of the scriptures, and that's an important distinction for us to make. God could be a dictator, and instead God chooses to be an influence. God chooses to inspire. And so when we do notice differences and have questions, we're not questioning God or we're not questioning the authority of the scriptures, and instead those questions are able ways to enable us to enter more deeply into God's word. Carl Broughton describes the Bible in this way. The Bible is the word of God, completely and irreducibly expressed in human words in all their time-conditionedness. So, the more we know about how the Bible came to be and about the human authors who are part of the scriptures, the more deeply we will understand the word. And to think of the Bible as irreducibly expressed in human words means that we can't separate the Bible into the human parts and the divine parts. Irreducibly expressed in human words. As Paul writes, all scripture is inspired by God. So the Bible is inspired. It is also inspiring. Inspiring, motivating, asking us to act. Karen Armstrong in her book, The Case for God, says that the rabbis called scripture mikra, which is a summons to action. So the purpose of, of a Bible study when we open the Bible is not so that if we're ever on Jeopardy someday, we can get the $2,000 question right if it's about the Bible. It's not about Bible trivial pursuit. It's about being changed by the Bible. The purpose of studying the Bible is to change us and to shape us and to shape us up when that's needed from time to time into being the people of God. Paul writes, Scripture is useful for teaching and for reproof. There's the shaping up part, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. And so the Scriptures, Paul says, is an inspired and also inspiring home. Jesus says in, in chapter 8 of John's Gospel, if you make my word your home, you will truly be my disciples. So what will happen when we make the Bible our home? Well, it'll stop being a strip mine for us, where we dig down and find what we want and leave the rest of it piled up in a heap. And it won't be a shopping mall. It, it won't be a hospital where we only go when we really, really need help. It won't be a factory that we use to manufacture what we want. It, it won't be a fast food restaurant where we pick up a few McNuggets when we get the spiritual munchies. It's not going to be a cave where we can hide out from the world and imagine how things used to be. Jesus invites us to make his word our home, a place of safety, a place of, of guidance. And so how well would we know our physical homes if we lived in them the same amount of time as we live in the Bible as a spiritual home? How well would we know that home in which we live if we only spent the same amount of time there as we spend in reading the Word of God? So, as we think about an inspired and inspiring home, some questions might come to mind. What, what version do I read? What version? Um, for devotion, I think it's important to find a, a version of the Bible that, that makes sense to you, that you can understand easily. I tell people one of the easiest ways to de determine a version of the Bible for devotional reading is to take a passage you really like, maybe the 23rd Psalm, and read it in a lot of different versions. And the one that you like best, that's probably the one that you can pick for devotional reading. I use the, the message, uh, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase. It's not a translation, so I don't use it for study. I use it for devotion. For study, I try to find a Bible that is a word-for-word -word translation, like New Revised, that we read in public worship most of the time. There are annotated versions of that, and so you can find some with footnotes and headings and, and those things that are not in the original text if you would like more information about that as well. And so whatever passage we read, how can we, how can we approach it simply and faithfully? Um, if you've ever taken disciple Bible study, you know these three questions because they were part of almost every unit in there, and that is to ask three questions no matter the passage. What does this passage tell us about God? And what does this passage tell us about us as human beings? And, and what does this passage tell us about the relationship between God and human beings? So 
So what does 2 Timothy 3 tell us about God? God inspires and doesn't dictate. That's important information to know about God. And what does this passage tell us about who we are? Well, we're people who try, and we often get it wrong. If you read the first five verses of chapter 3, you'll see where Paul uh, lists time after time after time how followers of Jesus get it wrong. So we're people who strive, but we don't always get it right. And what's the relationship then between God and us? God teaches in lots of different ways. As, as uh, Paul writes, Timothy, remember from whom you have learned, plural. Remember from your mother and your grandmother and me and the other ways you have learned about God. And also, God teaches us through these scriptures that we read. God speaks through them as well, so we might be proficient, so we might be effective followers of Jesus Christ, equipped for every good work. So this week, I invite you to open the Bible to a passage, maybe one that's unfamiliar to you, and ask yourself, what is this passage telling me about God? And what's it telling me about me? And what's it telling me about the relationship between God and me? That's a way that we can indeed um, live in this inspired and inspiring word and make it our home. Make it so, God, for you and for me. Let's pray. God, we thank you in this day for the scriptures, your written word, in which we encounter you and are encountered by you and your living word, Jesus. We thank you for that. We thank you for the authors and how you inspired them and, and continue to inspire us today by those words to be more and to be better than we have been in the past. Help us to be open and help us to study together that together we might learn how to be your people in this place and in this time. We thank you for these wonderful words that lead us to life in this life and in the next. For it is in Christ's name that we pray.